We are on. All right. Uh, well, for everyone who is online, uh, I just found out that there's about a minute and a half delay. So if, <laughs> if there is input, then it'll be delayed and we'll, I guess we'll, we'll try to wait for that next time. But sorry if I didn't address if you typed something in and responded to something I said and it wasn't mentioned because there was the delay. So I guess I moved on too quickly. Um, but uh, so now we're going to be doing uh, a session on dating. And I'm going to begin uh, just by defining, I think, what the purpose and what we need to have our minds set on when we're in dating uh, and the topic of dating. And, and dating is an interesting topic for us to discuss as Christians because there is no special revelation on dating. God did, has not told us how it ought to be done. What we have in Scripture is we are told how we as Christians ought to live, and what we therefore have to do is contextualize what we know our lives are to look like as faithful followers of Jesus and try to discern, well, what does that mean for dating? Since that is a very uh, a much more modern phenomenon that didn't occur in the Bible. Um, so the things that I want us to kind of look at and bring some maybe clarity to, uh, to begin with, is first covenant making. And I want us to look at God and the gospel uh, just because the relationship between a man and a woman, even when it begins in dating, the end goal of that is an image of Jesus in the church. Uh, second, I want us to look at and just ask some questions about how do, how do we determine the purpose of dating? Uh, and third, how do we glorify God in dating? And those are the three things that I want us to look at in our time. Sorry, I'm looking totally at the camera. You guys are here. I'm looking at you too. Um, so, to begin, what is God interested in when it comes to a relationship between a man and a woman? Um, one of the foundational texts for this, as I'm sure we're all familiar with, is Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. In it, Paul says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Paul says, This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So the Lord is interested in seeing the love between Jesus and the church replicated in a relationship through covenant-based love. Covenantal love is exclusive, it is loyal, uh, it is eternal, it is unifying, and it's also sacrificial. In Ephesians, Paul says Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And then Jesus in Matthew 16 of us, he says, if anyone would come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So for those who want to marry or feel called to marry and want to begin dating, what we need to acknowledge is that the pursuit of that relationship and, and the pursuit of a dating relationship is, is meant to be a foretaste to the reenactment of God's divine love for sinners. And as we're familiar with, with Paul, how he describes love to us in 1 Corinthians 13, and it's just beautiful, but he says love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all all things endures, all things, love never ends. Uh, that is true love, covenantal love, that we see manifested in the scripture. Uh, it, that, that type of love is an imitation of God's loyal love that never ends. But of course, that isn't how, how our modern culture defines love at all. Uh, the love that we see that kind of marks modern culture is one of consumerism. It's the type of love that says, I'm willing to love you, I'm willing to pay out that love to you, so long as the services you render to me in this relationship uh, are satisfying to me. I'm willing to love you and be with you, so long as you are meeting my needs. That's again why ultimately most divorces end up taking place, is because somewhere in there, the consumerism need often isn't being met. But uh, this isn't the Christian conception of love, which has Jesus as its ultimate example. He gains nothing from us, 
yet he gives everything for us. This, is, this type of covenant love says, I will love you no matter the cost. I require nothing in return. I will sacrifice even when there is no uh, perceived benefit to be gained. And, and that is exactly why Jesus can say something like, love your enemies. In loving an enemy, you don't see any gain or benefit. Uh, to the contrary, your enemy will still probably just continue to hate you, to persecute you, to dislike you, to imprison you. But Jesus loved his enemies. Therefore, if we are also to, to have that type of covenant to love that dictates our lives, he says, well, therefore, you need to love your enemies too, because that is an imitation of what I do. So when it comes to dating and entering into a relationship, we need to, to be thinking along the lines of this covenant to love. We don't want to be thinking like a consumer um, because God being loving and faithful is interested in covenant making and keeping because it's a reflection of his character. And of course, in dating, no covenant yet exists. That, that's prior to the covenant making process uh, at a marriage ceremony. But while dating, we do need to keep our eyes on God's great purpose for relationships to know this is what God is aiming at. He's aiming at a covenant. He's not aiming for me to be in a relationship where what I'm looking for is just to have my needs met. My needs, my needs met. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, so while dating, it is a time to begin praying for and, and, and thinking about and in little ways starting to practice covenantal love that binds married couples together uh, because that is the love that ultimately binds God and the church together. If we're not thinking covenantally, if that isn't our ultimate aim for whatever, whatever relationship we're in, then I ultimately think the Christian probably doesn't have any business entering into a relationship. Because saying I do to someone isn't going to transform you into a covenant keeper if you've never been interested in, in that in the first place. If covenant faithfulness isn't something you've sought to cultivate in your soul and your heart before marriage, getting married won't somehow cause a covenant love to finally take root in you. We, before marriage, we want to be actively seeking to root out uh, any ideas that we have that love is about consuming, because love ultimately is about sacrifice. And the romance that doesn't have God's covenantal love as its foundation an ultimate aim, it won't end up imitating God, uh, God or the gospel. And instead, it will find a worldly uh, ideal to imitate instead, because it must imitate something. The question is, though, in your dating relationship, are you going to be having that mind about you that says, well, ultimately, I want to try to imitate God's covenant faithfulness if this dating relationship takes me to marriage? Or in that dating relationship, some other ideal will take hold if that isn't what is ultimately our aim. Um, and while that relationship, even if, if it is imitating some worldly ideal, it may be pleasurable, it may be fun, but it ultimately won't be seeking your good or the good of the person that you may be in a relationship with. The highest good we can do for someone we are in a relationship with is to point them to Jesus and to seek uh, their continued sanctification and their continued fellowship with Jesus. Okay, so moving on to the, my next point that I want us to look at is, is what is the purpose of dating? And I think when we think about the purpose of dating, uh, it's going to ultimately be defined by many questions that we have to answer for ourselves that, that depend on all kinds of varying ideas and beliefs. Where are you in your life and maturity? Are, are you just looking to have fun? Are you dating because that's the cultural norm? Um, have you taken thought to see if you're ready for that type of spiritual, emotional, mental, uh, 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 financial, or time commitments that a relationship require? Uh, how important is having a Jesus-centered relationship to you? Is that something that you deeply want? Or is that just an add-on if it happens to take place? Or, or what role should friendship play in dating? Uh, can we date someone if we don't really know them yet and see if a friendship is formed through that dating relationship? Uh, is dating a time to be testing your compatibility with someone? Uh, or should you date someone that you already have 
uh, that is already a trusted and known friend? Uh, how seriously do you take dating? Is it just a casual relationship between two people that aren't interested in anything too serious? Or do you view it, view it as a pseudo marriage where you can have, a, have certain perks of marriage uh, without the spiritual and legal commitments? Or is, it a mere, or is it a relationship that you take very seriously, kind of like what we just said, that you want to maybe cultivate in covenant making? Or what role should romance play in dating? Are you dating just because you want a sexual partner? Or, or how emotionally connected do you think you should be to that person in dating? Um, and of course, I don't. there's all kinds of questions we could talk about, and I don't have the time to address those. Um, but answering questions like these is what will inform us to what we think the purpose of dating is. Um, and hopefully as Christians, though, our primary ideas that are influencing us are based on God's truth and wisdom. Again, God hasn't given us a playbook of saying, OK, this is how you date. This is how this takes place and this and this and this. This is how much time you need to spend together. This is how much you need to open up and how much emotional uh, support you should be drawing from this person at this stage. <laughs> None of those things are quite revealed to us. But what he has told us uh, is that we are to pursue holiness and that we are to live like him. And because we're soaked, though, in a Western culture that is all about consuming, about trying to gain and meet get our needs met from people, we are so prone to wanting to determine and define our purpose for our, for our dating relationships um, through those ideas. And for many people, again, that purpose, when they define a, a, maybe a dating relationship, probably doesn't go much further than saying, well, how much happiness and pleasure am I gaining from this relationship? How is this meeting my wants and needs? But I think that question is fundamentally the wrong question for a Christian to ask when determining the purpose of a dating relationship. You know, from eternity past, Jesus decided to save his bride by atoning for her sins with his own life. He was not driven by a self-seeking desire, and he was not concerned with how much happiness and pleasure the church could bring him. But he was driven by covenantal love for his elect people. So when considering dating, we need to be thoroughly immersed in, in mindful and thoughtful uh, Bible-based uh, theology that keeps the cross at the center of that relationship. We need to ask deep and probing questions about, again, God's purposes for this. We don't need to be governed by passivity when entering a relationship, by just letting it go. But we want to say, Spirit, mold this relationship however you see fit. Use me in the role that you're calling me to be in, in this situation. Oh, and we don't certainly don't want to take at face value whatever dating model uh, that we've seen, seen modeled for us or that we're familiar with, because often a lot of those really don't align up to scripture. And we also, again, need to resolve not to be a consumer, but a sacrificial servant. Don't chiefly be concerned about seeing your needs met, but think about how you can meet the needs of the person you're dating. And of course, we want to be using wisdom and determining can I can I see myself with this person? Are it, do do we truly can we formulate a, uh, a a relationship that is going to bring glory to God? Um, and there's all a host of all kinds of other very practical things that you could also need to consider that that I, Carla is definitely I think going to be addressing a lot of those things. Um, but moving on just to my final point, the thing that I want us to think about. Uh, at the end is is glorifying God in dating, because I think that is one of the most pivotal things that will help us define on how to honor um, honor God in dating and formulate a good approach and decide can we be with this person ultimately. Um, again, how to glorify God? It's a fairly simple question. It's hopefully one that we're all asking, not just in say relationships, but in maybe our work or regular friendships, or our hobbies, whatever it is. We want glorifying God to be at the center of everything we do. So hopefully it is a question we ask routinely. Um, but I definitely think it's something that needs to be brought into dating because dating is something that leads to many other opportunities in life. Something that can, be, can define our lives in huge ways. 
if especially if that dating relationship goes on to marriage. So we want to make sure that at the heart of that relationship, God is being glorified. Um, so there's four things I want to say how I think we can glorify God in a dating relationship. We will glorify God in dating by acknowledging that no man or woman can satisfy us or bring us pleasure like God. Um, of course, dating and marriage, those are things that there is a huge amount of joy and happiness and pleasure to be derived from, from that. But only of the Lord is it said, uh, in your presence there's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I mean, as, as joyful as your boyfriend or your girlfriend may be, you can't say that about them. There is no fullness of joy at their right hand, and there are pleasures forevermore will not be experienced in them. <laughs> um, and if we are dating to ultimately fill some uh, some lack of pleasure, that uh, some perceived lack of pleasure in our heart, uh, what we need isn't a man or a woman, but what we need is to draw closer to Jesus and seek him more intently. If we are dating... Uh, 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 to make up for some lack that we have in our relationship with God, what will end up happening is we'll end up worshiping that other person. We'll end up probably making them an idol because what we'll be seeking from them is something only God can give us. Um, and that's, of course, he, he did not create a man or a woman to meet your deepest needs. Um, and if you seek that from someone, inevitably that person will fail you. And what usually follows after a great failure like that is is a breaking and a fracturing of that relationship or that marriage. Second, the second way we can glorify God in dating is we will glorify God in dating when we put the good of the other before our own good. Again, this is putting into practice that idea that covenant to love is ultimately what God is going to be seeking out of that relationship if it ends up in marriage. Paul in Philippians 2 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. And then Paul grounds this command in Jesus, saying, Jesus made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. So it's easy for dating to become a very selfish pursuit. It's probably one of the more natural things in life to want to date someone and just be selfish in that relationship. Um, but a good way to combat that is to remember that whoever you're dating isn't your servant, but you are their servant. <laughs> um, sorry, my kids are peeking out the door. Do you need something, Bob? I'm going to be done really soon. Can you wait? You want that open, don't you? Just give me like... Four minutes and I'll be in there. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is what happens when you end up in a covenantally loving someone. when you have little kids poking <laughs> in when you're like, trying to do something. Um, but if we are, are practicing humility and kindness by seeking to serve that person um, and we consider their needs as more significant than our own, we will be imitating Jesus in that dating relationship. Um, thirdly, we will glorify God in dating when our aim in that relationship is a deeper knowledge and affection for God. We will glorify God in dating when our aim in that relationship is a deeper knowledge and affection for God. Um, we all know that dating will carry with it various temptations. That's very obvious. No one's, no one's surprised by that. But if our objective in dating is to see Jesus manifest his presence in that relationship and draw both participants closer to him in love, then the power that temptation can wield in that relationship will be weakened. Um, everyone will have temptation when dating, but 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 and it's it's inevitable that that's going to occur. But we have to combat that because we know that it's going to happen. Um, and we will make war against those temptations by setting our minds on something that is more satisfying and more pleasurable than that relationship, which is Jesus himself. And my fourth point is we will glorify God before we start dating if we begin to practice loving our future husband or wife now. And what I mean by that is that, uh, he opened it by himself, such a big kid. Um, Good job. <laughs> 
So the time to begin loving your future spouse isn't when you meet them and it isn't when you marry them, but it's now. And contrary to what most people believe, dating or being in a relationship isn't going to make you become a good lover. That is learned, uh, being a good lover will be learned from spending time in the presence of Jesus. And that, of course, should be happening, hopefully before you're in a dating relationship. Mm -hmm. um, because even before you marry, God knows who that person is going to be. And in hopeful anticipation and covenantal faithfulness, love that person from a distance, from a place of faithful trust in God's sovereign plan. Even though you may not know them, they, you may not know them, maybe you do know them, but maybe you don't know what's going to occur. But love them from a distance, even and from a place of knowing that, of, of unknown, by praying for them, um, by seeking to honor them with your current decisions and choices, by planning for the future wisely, uh, by becoming more like Jesus, and by cultivating good discipline and habits that will benefit a marriage relationship in the future. Uh, and of course, God doesn't call everyone to be married, and that's okay, and that's a good thing. There's a lot of blessings in singleness that are often overlooked. Um, but as a single person, and even if you think, oh, I don't want to be married, that, that isn't something that I want for my life, it still is a good thing to assume and open, be open to the possibility that maybe God will call you to marry. You don't know, we don't know what his plans are for our futures always. It could be singleness but it could be marriage. Therefore, if you are in a place of singleness, I think it's always good to be practicing things that will potentially cultivate a good relationship in the future if marriage does take place for you, to honor God in that, uh, just in case he does bless you with a marriage, even if you don't, if that's something you don't want, because not everybody is interested in that, um, even though most are. Um, but I'm done with my portion, so now if, uh, Carla, you like to? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for bringing us up to speed on how to honor God in our dating. Um, I want to speak about honoring yourself, honoring others, and then some practical tips on dating. I have to voice a disclaimer. I am not an expert on dating at all. I haven't studied this. I, I don't have an academic degree in uh, sociology of dating, psychology of dating, the science of, no, none of that. What I do have is some experience. And so I want to speak about honoring yourself. And when I do, I'm speaking about esteeming and loving yourself, not about pride, which is going to puff you up and make you think you're better than other people. But I'm talking about knowing inside that you have worth. Yes, unfortunately, you can be a born-again, praying, Bible-reading, God-serving person and have no self-esteem. How do I know? Because that was me decades ago. I did not have a spiritual problem. I had untreated depression. And one of the uh, symptoms of untreated depression is low self-esteem. My self-esteem was so low, I had to get down on the floor to look up to see its backside. <laughs> For years, I walked around ashamed of myself. Full of self-criticism, I mentally critiqued everything I said and everything I did. In my mind, I did not make mistakes. In my mind, I was a mistake. I was not emotionally healthy, and this manifested itself in the way I related to other people. Um, the only esteem I could get was from helping other people. And almost everybody has a need to be needed. But people who are emotionally healthy, they'll have boundaries around what you're willing to do, what you're willing to put up with in order to help another person. I didn't have those boundaries. I gravitated towards needy men. Was I aware of this propensity at the time? No, unfortunately. I wrote, uh, I got a job after college writing for a Christian drug rehab ministry, Teen Challenge, as a matter of fact. 
uh, met, I met an athletic, good looking young man who was making good grades in college. He had graduated from the drug program and we started dating. Eventually we married. Uh, right from the beginning, I felt something was wrong. Instead of emotional closeness and growing trust, he kept himself distant and he began using manipulation to keep me from seeing the truth about his life as he slowly went back to drugs. Let me tell you, there is no despair so deep as that of a committed Christian in an unequally yoked marriage with an addict. Addicts can only succeed in their addiction by deceiving and manipulating their partner into supporting them. My spouse used violence, guilt, blame, verbal attacks. Are, those are just some of the manipulations he used to keep me off balance so that he could continue his love affair with his first love, which was drugs. One non-Christian counselor recommended I read a book entitled Women Who Love Too Much. Man, that book showed me that if I didn't make some very real inside changes, I would continue to be attracted over and over and over again to users and addicts. So the next thing I do, I did, that particular non-Christian counselor didn't really respect my Christian values. She just thought I was one sick cookie, which I needed help for sure. But part of my reason for staying in that marriage was like that I had made a commitment to God. So the next day, next I found a professionally trained Christian counselor who helped me work through the extreme guilt and grief I felt about my ultimate divorce. I was determined to grow emotionally and mentally, so I stayed in counseling. I was determined not to make the same kind of um, mistake again. So I read every book I could. I went to seminars on codependence and addiction and self-esteem. I began to get a more objective view of others, including my ex-husband and my work tormentors. And slowly through his word, prayer and support, God began healing me. Slowly, I began to see positive qualities in myself and my inner crit critic began to fade away. Honoring others in dating. How do you show honor and love to others, to your friends and to your coworkers? Um, Conrad covered a lot of this, but Jesus instructed us to treat others the way we would like to be treated. If you would like to be treated with gentleness, kindness, patience, and honesty, then you need to treat others that way. Scripture also says that we are to speak the truth in love, and that's in Ephesians 4.15. Among other things, this should lead you in a dating um, situation to, if there's a conflict, you say what you need to say in a gentle kind manner. If there's a preference, your date says, well, we could either do A or we could do B, you need to be honest. And if you prefer B, say, ah, my natural inclination is towards this particular activity. Um, the other thing it plays out in is not leading somebody on. If you've gone out with somebody a couple times, or even if you can tell right off the bat that you feel like you don't have anything in common with the person, um, let them know, be gentle about it. <laughs> don't lead somebody on just for your own selfish ends. Okay, two practical matters in dating. I didn't realize this, but I did these two things when I was dating. In the book, How to Get a Date Worth Keeping, Henry Cloud recommends that you, A, get a dating coach. I had two, uh, being a special needs case. Um, <laughs> B, that you get your numbers up, which means you start meeting some eligible Christian singles. Okay, getting a dating coach. What does a dating coach do? Well, 
they can help you gain perspective. Uh, I don't know about other people, but if I was, I'll say rejected, but that's a very strong word. If a relationship didn't continue for whatever reason while I was dating, um, I would I would be very introspective. What did I do wrong? Did I say the wrong thing? Do my feet smell? I mean, <laughs> talk to me. <laughs> tell me. Uh, my feet don't smell, and probably it had nothing to do much with what I said because <laughs> sometimes other people have their own priorities, and also they may not be in a place where they're ready to make a strong commitment to develop a relationship that might lead towards marriage. Um, so perspective is one of the things a dating coach can help you with. The second thing is helping you to stay true to your Christian values. There were two times when I was dating before I met this person. <laughs> this is scary, by the way, my husband. <laughs> um, yeah. There were two times when, frankly, I was quite tempted to um, to break one of the Ten Commandments, shall we say. I'll let you figure out which one. <laughs> and, and it wasn't the murder one. <laughs> and uh, the first time I went and I just, I was speaking to our singles pastor at church mm -hmm. and he said, you know, if you give in, this guy will probably break up with you anyway. And he was absolutely right. I didn't give in and the guy broke up with me. He, uh, anyway, that particular gentleman who had been raised with an alcoholic father and he ended up marrying an alcoholic. Not good. Okay, so the second thing, uh, get your numbers up. How do you meet people? <laughs> uh, I met men through work, Bible studies, a church single group, uh, group, and Christian friends. Now, there are also, nowadays, you have to understand, I was dating before the internet took off. Um, I'll tell you someday how Carrie and I met. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there are online websites like eHarmony, Christian Mingle. I don't know anymore. Do you guys, anybody? I don't recommend Tinder because Tinder seems to be, shall we say, a hookup site. Mm -hmm. And it will not support your Christian values. So that's that. And I do have. Um, both a bibliography and a, um, this is a single ad, and it says SF, meaning single female, seeks male companionship, age and ethnicity unimportant. I'm young, spelt, good looking girl who loves to play. I love long walks in the woods, riding in your pickup truck hunting, camping, fishing trips. I love cozy winter nights spent lying by the fire. Candlelight dinners will have me eating out of your hand. Rub me the right way and watch me respond. I'll be at the front door when you get home from work wearing only what nature gave me. Kiss me and I'm yours. <laughs> Call and it gives the number and ask for Daisy. So the phone number was the Humane Society and Daisy was an eight week old black Labrador puppy. <laughs> Can you see that? Uh, yeah. Here she is. I would have called for Daisy too, but not for the same reasons. <laughs> That's basically what I have to say uh, you may not be in the place of having untreated depression. I was a pretty extreme case. I think all of us uh, come into adulthood somewhere on the healthy, emotionally healthy continuum. Um, but if there's something that's keeping you back from being yourself with other people, 
and you feel pain inside, I would suggest maybe you start with by reading the book Boundaries. You, you may benefit from um, some counseling with a trained counselor. Um, yeah, there's lots of books uh, that can help you with these things. There's an updated version of Boundaries is by John Townsend and Cloud, Henry Cloud. Yeah, and then they have Boundaries and Dating. Excellent, I haven't read it, but I'm sure it's good. How to Get a Date Worth Keeping is also by Henry Cloud. All of these are really good. You can find a heap of information on the internet about um, emotional health and that kind of thing. Oh, be careful <laughs> where you <laughs> pick up and read information on that subject. So, Pastor's going to talk with us about. You see where you're from. Okay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Now you finally see me on the camera, uh, also here. Um, but since we're talking about God's will for your lives, and since you're talk we're talking about uh, knowing God's will, and we're talking about dating specifically, um, one of the things we made very clear was that some things in the scripture are made very clear for us. Um, might not name the person we're supposed to marry, but there are certain boundaries that the Bible does give us about uh, dating um, and or a marriage. Um, and so we're going to talk, I'm, I'm, I've been asked to share a little bit about the consequences of marrying an unbeliever, uh, because that issue is actually spelled out pretty clearly in the scriptures. And so I'm going to start with the, uh, the biblical principle to hopefully encourage you, because at least for me, if God has said it, then I can do nothing but agree with it and obey it. Um, so for me, it's enough to know, well, God said it, so then I'll do it. Uh, but there are other things perhaps that uh, will motivate you to, to um, uh, be obedient as well. And maybe some of the wisdom that I've gained over the years and the experience that I've seen um, will be helpful in that regard as well. But let's start with the biblical principle because hopefully you'll be convinced simply because the Bible said it. Um, and it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 14. 1 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 14, says this, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial, or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said, and then he quotes uh, some scripture there. And then after the quote in verse 1 of chapter 7, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness and completion in the fear of God. So how much clearer can you get? I mean, uh, the Apostle Paul says very clearly, just do not be unequally yoked with, with unbelievers. And then he gives some really good reasons why not. Um, so let's just analyze it real quickly first. Uh, what does it mean to be yoked? Well, it is a binding relationship to be yoked together. And what could be more binding than a covenant between man and woman to be married until death do us part? That is a binding agreement. Um, it is a metaphor, this yokedness or unequally yoked. It's a metaphor of oxen pulling the same yoke in the same direction. And so you have to be equal if you're going to be pulling the same yoke in the same direction or else the two oxen would be fighting each other. Uh, one is exhausting the other. Um, and uh, so this is the, the, the metaphor for this uh, relationship that's binding. Uh, and notice also what uh, Paul, um, what words Paul uses to describe it. He uses the word partnership fellowship, accord, uh, sharing a portion, and agreement. How else can you describe what a uh, being yoked together would be, but a partnership, a fellowship, sharing a portion, being in an agreement? And then he also makes some very stark contrasts between the two items, right? You, you look at, he says, uh, what partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? I mean, how far apart are those two? 
uh, or light and darkness. Um, Christ and Belial, in other words, a, a, a demonic um, uh, power, the believer and the unbeliever is just as contrasted as all of those. And then the temple of God and idols. And then he goes into this uh, um, argument to show how God has made us into a temple of his. Um, and then concludes by saying, since we have these promises, since we are this temple of the living God, since we're told to, be, uh, to remain pure, then let's cleanse ourselves from every defilement. So um, not only is there no partnership or fellowship or all of those things between those two, but there's also this aspect of one is pure and the other is defiled um, or defiles oneself. So if marriage is intended to glorify God and for the Christians, marriage is intended for you to do God's will together um, and his work together, then obviously there's no, not going to be uh, any room for you marrying an unbeliever if you're a believer. Um, and yet, it is hard to believe that believers still marry unbelievers. <laughs> Christians committed to Christ somehow still end up in a marriage that is um, with an unbeliever. Now, I understand sometimes you're both unbelievers when you get married and then one becomes a believer. Mm -hmm. and that happens. Um, and then there's specific instruction on that as well. But since this is a seminar for singles, um, I'm speaking to those who are currently believers, I hope, um, and that you have some decisions and choices that you still can make. Um, and our hope, of course, is that you follow God's will, and it's this seminar as well. <laughs> um, and, and then also our hope is that you obey specifically this particular uh, thing that's, that's been so clearly revealed. Um, but here's the typical scenario that I've seen in the years of ministry. And if we count when I first started volunteering in youth ministry, then it's close to 30 years, actually. Yes, I am that old. I know I don't look that old, no, but I no, am that old. Not at all. Uh, I started when I was about four. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't. That's not true. Um, but so here's the scenario that, that tends to be typical. Um, the typical scenario that I've seen is that oftentimes it's the f female that's the believer and the male that's the unbeliever. Granted, my ministry has mostly been in Denmark in these last 18 years. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, that oftentimes uh, within our international community, we have women coming to church, single women, they're Christians, uh, and oftentimes they meet someone here in Denmark, um, and oftentimes those men aren't believers. Um, so that seems to be the most common that I've seen. It's not the only one I've seen. I have also uh, met Christian men who are married to unbelieving wives, and a lot of the counseling was because their um, wife was an unbeliever, but uh, most often uh, the female is a believer, um, and in almost every case, the unbeliever is not directly opposed to the believer's faith. And this is exactly why it gets a little bit tricky, is because the person seems open to coming to church, to talking about religious things, they're not a believer, but they're not opposed to you being a believer. Um, I think also if they were directly opposed, I don't think they, you would have continued or this person would have continued uh, uh, in the examples I'm thinking of. And then um, in the typical scenario, the unbeliever then begins to justify dating because dating doesn't seem to be a direct violation of this unequally yoked, right? You're not in a covenant marriage yet. Um, you're just seeing each other often um, spending a lot of time together, and the person's still open. So oftentimes, dating then uh, is justifiable. Um, but what then happens next is that the believer, un, uh, almost in every case, will begin to compromise in their relationship with Christ. So how much time you spend with Christians and with Christ begins to change. How often you come to church, a regular uh, they're there, how involved you are in the fellowship of the church and how many other Christian friends you keep um, begins to change. And then oftentimes, I've also seen this, that they are in leadership positions before they started dating, but because of their choice of dating an unbeliever, uh, they've had to forfeit that leadership position because it's been addressed to them. Um, and they're willing to actually forfeit that leadership position. 
um, for this relationship. Um, and it can be a variety of leadership uh, types, even uh, whether it's in on the worship team or um, doing a fellowship <laughs> event or uh, running the singles or even even a, a youth um, uh, event uh, in a youth ministry. And then what happens next, usually after some compromise, they begin not just compromising, but actually justifying their dating relationship. So now they're saying it's the right thing to do because without me, they wouldn't ever go to church as one of the examples. Or they're asking a lot of questions now about my faith. Even we've started to pray together. So it should be all right that I'm dating this unbeliever. Um, if we break up now, then he or she will never come to faith. Another justification that this is the right thing to do. God wants me in this relationship. Missionary dating. Um, yeah, we call that missionary dating. Mm -hmm. um, and then this uh, deception as well. If we marry, he or she will eventually come to faith. Um, but 1 Corinthians 7 tells us you don't know about whether or not your spouse will come uh, to faith or not. Um, and then if the relationship has become physically, emotionally, maybe even sexually intimate, um, then they, get, they reach a point where now the relationship can only go one of two ways, either into marriage, which is the direct violation of this passage that we've looked at, or a very painful breakup. And which would you choose of the two? Well, hopefully you'd say, I'll take the painful breakup. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes they don't take the painful breakup um, because they've already justified it up until now. It's the right thing to do. Even in God's eyes, it's the right thing to do. So this must be God's will for my life, and they do it. So then here are some of the consequences that I've, I've also seen, is in the beginning, of course, the marriage is blissful, mostly, mostly, right? Um, because it's all new, it's exciting, you've had a wedding, family's involved, um, you're spending a lot of time together, now the sexual intimacy can come to its uh, full end. Um, but soon enough, there will be disagreement because Soon enough, they're no longer partners trying to achieve the same goal. That's that yoke aspect again. Someone's pulling the yoke, and, some, and the other one isn't. Uh, you no longer having, you don't have the same philosophy, uh, and you don't agree on priorities. So here's some some issues that oftentimes comes up. Uh, who comes first, my spouse or God, or the body of Christ? Um, how should we spend our Sundays? That oftentimes becomes an issue. Um, how much does the Lord want us to give? You know, making a sacrifice or tithing out of your income um, becomes an issue as well. Uh, what habits does Christ call me to forsake? Or what habits does he call me to take up? Because um, the partner usually won't uh, be supportive about those decisions. Um, or if you make important decisions about investment or housing or schooling or uh, what should the children be taught about faith or Christ? Um, issues on baptism, confirmation, um, church membership. Uh, what behavior is acceptable for our children? Because there's going to be a, a, very, a, a variety of, of uh, behaviors acceptable in culture, but not necessarily acceptable by Christ. Um, and then what value should we live by? Christ or the cultures? Because uh, it's music, movies, recreation, it's all of those little decisions we'll have to make. Um, and the reason that it becomes a disagreement is because usually the believer's spouse doesn't agree with or fully support or encourage any of those principles that are uh, biblical. And so what happens then for the believer is that your spiritual growth slows down or stagnates, your intimacy in the marriage begins to ebb, and uh, your involvement at church all but disappears. Um, and it's sad when you were otherwise as a single person, very involved in church, growing spiritually, uh, engaged with other Christians, um, and then all of a sudden that all begins to fade away. And it all started with um, this idea that, well, dating isn't quite the, uh, a violation yet, so it should be all right. Um, in the end, uh, the marriage either continues in painful isolation or the marriage ends painfully. Um, so here's uh, what I see as perhaps some wisdom that hopefully you can take with you is that when you compromise on your standards for dating, then you are more likely than not simply pushing your painful experience into the future. 
And the more into the future that you push that experience, the more painful it could potentially be. And as I was kind of thinking, okay, after I've shared some of these things, I decided to go on the internet and see, well, what do other people say about this? Uh, and I came across a very interesting article, which perhaps I could have just started with and just read it out loud for you. <laughs> but it was written by um, uh, Kathy Keller, Tim Keller's wife, uh, in an article called, Don't Take It From Me, Reasons You Should Not Marry an Unbeliever. And uh, Kathy Keller says that in their experience of pastoral ministry, all of those years of their experience, the most common pastoral issue that Tim and I have faced is this believers marrying unbelievers. That says a lot. I mean, of years of pastoral ministry, and that's the most common thing that you're, you're dealing with in your counseling, uh, that's shocking to me. Um, but she also says this very wisely. She says, when someone has already allowed his or her heart to become engaged with a person outside the faith, I find that the Bible has already been devalued as the non-negotiable rule of faith and practice. Instead, variants of the serpent's question to Eve, did God really say, are floated as if somehow this case might be eligible for an exemption. And she makes the case in her article that if, all I could, if, uh, if, if only I could just bring someone who's currently in a very painfully isolated marriage as a believer with an unbeliever, and just share this with everyone else, then that should be enough, is basically the point of this article. Um, that I could just bring someone in into the counseling session and just have them tell you this is how painful it is. And here is a quote from someone who was married to a perfectly nice man who did not share her faith. Quote, if you think you are lonely before you get married, it's nothing compared to how lonely you can be after you're married. That's the testimony of a person who's in a marriage and she's hoping, just listen to this, if anything else. Of course, I'm hoping you'll obey the scriptures and um, listen to what the, the Lord has to say. Um, the article ends basically with three true outcomes um, when a believer marries an unbeliever. Outcome number one, the Christian marginalizes Christ. Outcome number two, the partner is marginalized. Outcome number three, stress and breakup, or stress and loneliness, unhappiness, which is basically what I was also concluding as well. Um, that that is the eventual outcome for it. So um, hopefully that is encouragement, urging enough for you uh, to say already now, especially as Connor was also saying that preparing yourself for the covenant relationship. Uh, that you are already now intending to glorify God in your uh, relationships, and especially then when it comes to who are you going to be dating. Um. All right. And um, I'm sorry I didn't say, but uh, when I married my first husband, I thought he was a Christian. And after we married, I realized he wasn't. And it was miserable just miserable it's better to be single than wishing that you were single mm -hmm. um, yeah. i've only heard in all the years that i've been a christian i've only heard of one woman who prayed for her non-christian spouse for 25 years they had children he wasn't a horrible man 25 years she prayed for him and finally he came to the Lord. That's an awfully long time. Mm -hmm. And it's, trust me, it's not worth the gamble. Because yeah. most of the time it doesn't end that way. But it's, it's good to know that it is, it is possible. Right? And just like people, people think as well, well, maybe my case is different and my case it is possible. Mm -hmm. I think that's the same way with most people who smoke. That some people yes. don't die of lung cancer, even though they smoke all their lives. Right? Um, Just the and everyone who still smokes and hasn't quit yet is thinking, well, I'm one of those that won't die of lung cancer. Yes. Um, and just on the uh, subject of uh, prayer, Carla and I pray almost every week for single adults mm -hmm. that if they want to be married, that they will find a Christian to marry. So please know that we pray for you. <laughs>
Um, we do have a little bit of time, like five minutes for some Q&A, so maybe yes. we can take some Are there any switch seats. Q&A uh, for yeah. you guys? Any? Well, I have yeah. a question. Sure. Um, there are some Q&A here too. And I think you've addressed it, but just to maybe um, specify it a bit more, because um, I have a friend who's in a situation where she is um, interested in a Muslim person, and her justification at the moment is that the Christian men she has met didn't have um, a good character. And this person is Muslim, but morally they are uh, very much mm -hmm. in alignment with each other because they share um, many of the same morals and principles and stuff like that. So how do you, I don't know, how do you, um, not encourage, but you know what I mean? How do you counsel someone like that who believes that we have similar morals, we have similar values, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. connect on a personal level, so that's why I want to pursue this relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, do you guys want to take a stab at that? Well, I can but, okay, I, I was just a little bit distracted because of the other question here, but if, if, I, if I can just, from the last thing that you said, um, that uh, sure there may be a lot of things that are still common and there may be some things that we agree on but when deep down in your soul one has the holy spirit and the other doesn't mm -hmm. then the intimacy you can achieve is actually um, uh, less intimate than a, a, another christian brother uh, who is not a dating interest mm -hmm. Because there, at least, you can share something that you don't have with uh, a person that you're dating, mm -hmm. and that is the, the common the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So you don't have that fellowship together. Yeah. And, um, so, yeah. and you're delaying the pain, like Pastor pointed out. You know, yeah. you're going to delay that pain down the line. You're going to pay the price by marrying a non-Christian. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's something that concerns me very much, and the reason you know, Carl and I pray. Or especially for women to marry Christian men because I look around and I see very few Christian men and I can understand why a single Christian female would look around and say where are the Christian men and uh, it's just something that concerns me very much why aren't there more Christian men available for you ladies who are so wonderful uh, you know uh, <laughs> yeah. yes <laughs> so uh, you, please know, I, I'm very much concerned. I, I want to see you marry Christian men, but where are they? And so I, I, I hope that, you know, that uh, men need to do the right thing. We need to be discipling other men. Uh, we need to be raising up the generation that will, you know, be the type of men. Because you're right, there are people who call themselves Christian whose morals are not consistent with Christian beliefs, and that concerns me. We need to do a better job. When I say me, we as men need to do a better job of stifling younger men to be the type of men. So, it's something that's very concerning to me, yes. Well, I think that's why, um, one of the reasons why Dr. Cloud says, do everything you can to get your numbers up whether that means joining um, an online dating service yes. every once in a while hanging out at a church uh, where there are a lot of Christians. Yes. Because um, unfortunately there are men who call themselves Christians or think of themselves as Christians but their goal is not relationship. Their goal is um, blood lay sex. And once they get it, yeah. Um, so Adrian has a little uh, has a question in here where he first of all appreciates Carla your testimony, um, and um, then um, he also mentions here that in every dating relationship there will be some strife and disagreement, which to some extent is also necessary and healthy for a relationship. Mm -hmm. Of course, most disagreement should be resolved. However, where would you suggest? one draw the red line in a relationship at which mutual forgiveness and relationship growth becomes one-sided and potentially abusive? Uh, where do you draw? Oh, that's a very good question. And I don't really have, you know, my red line marker out. But when you sense manipulation, 
when you sense somebody trying to control, um, when you're feeling like so frustrated because you can't resolve conflicts mm -hmm. together, then yeah. yeah. That's a red flag. And Carla and I had conflict when we were dating, but finally dawned upon me that was a, a good thing because it, like Jamie mentioned, because you need to know how can, can you solve conflict. It finally dawned upon me, Carla and I could solve conflict in dating. That means we can solve conflict in marriage. Mm -hmm. So it was it was good that we experienced conflict, mm -hmm. and, but it, it brought, gave me the, uh, uh, like go ahead was that we were able to work it out. Yeah. And so there's also a follow up then yeah. that uh, Adrian says from so-called Christian input that staying in a relationship that has such potentially abusive traits could be a trial that you need to endure. To what extent do you think that that applies and what scriptural evidence is there? Uh, what should be endured and when you shouldn't endure it, basically? I think that's um forgive me, but that's BS. <laughs> um, that's why you need a Christian counselor. Yes. Life brings us enough trials, trust me. Um, I'm blind in one eye. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. um, things happen. Um, somebody you love can't come to Denmark with you. Uh, you have to leave them behind. I mean, life has enough uh, sorrows and things that we have to endure. And a dating relationship that you're getting absolutely nothing out of. Talk to talk to somebody if you need to be strengthened in any way. If you need an objective, hopefully objective Christian viewpoint on the on the relationship. But that sounds awfully like cut it off, baby. No, you don't. The terminators that. here. Yeah. yeah, I agree. So what you're looking for in a, a a partner is a lifelong friend, somebody that can support you, come along and be your side. And that's what Carl and I developed a strong friendship first. Uh, so that, you know, that's what you need. You don't need to endure abuse. And then one more uh, from Megan writing, do you have recommendations where we can find good Christian therapists here in Copenhagen? Mm. I do not, but do you? I have just met someone who has a, um, a counseling uh, ministry. Um, I'm not ready to just outright recommend him just yet. I've only met him, um, but I do trust uh, the person whom I met him through. Um, so yes, uh, if anyone is looking for someone, um, then I do know someone uh, here in Denmark. But I would also always encourage if you do need uh, any kind of Christian counseling, talk to your pastor first, and then if uh, it is a situation that the pastor is either not trained enough or feels that uh, he needs you to go to a professional for, uh, then you can look for someone together. So I'm always willing to at least take a, a first uh, session um, to, uh, to talk about a situation. So if you know someone or if you are someone that would like um, uh, just some first initial uh, counseling, uh, I'm always available. Any other? Um, you guys have questions? You need lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well then uh, we'll take our lunch break and we will continue at one o'clock. So hopefully you brought your own lunch and those of you who are uh, virtually connected that you have a place way to get lunch as well and uh, we'll uh, turn off the video, but keep the live feed on because we'll just uh, put the timer on. We'll lunch in front of you.